Okay, so I'm happy to introduce our second speaker for this session, uh, Mohamed El Fodor Ihadadan from HCIAG. He's going to talk to you about uh, what they forgot to teach you about shiny development in production. Thank you for the introduction. Um, is the sound okay? Yeah, perfect. So thank you for being here. Just a few words about the title. Um, I tried to come up with a, with a catchy title, but I was lacking uh, imagination, so I took Jenny Bryan title, what they forgot to teach you about R, and just put shiny, so sorry, Jenny, if you see me. Um, so a few words about myself. My full name is Mohamed El Fodil Iadadan, but Mohamed is actually my middle name, and Fodil is my first name. Um, I'm from Algeria, but at the moment I'm working in Germany, in Hamburg. Um, and I work in a company called HDI, or HDE in German, which is an insurance company that does a lot of R in production. Um, in my spare time, I do some open source development, but I actually stopped because you can actually code R and getting money. Didn't know about that. And in my um, free time, I do also some training and consulting for um, a teaching school called Fisalia course. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is only my opinion. It's by no means the company's guideline or any person's guideline. It's just what I think. I fight always with my colleagues about it. Maybe I will fight with you. I hope some people will challenge me. And um, yeah, let's talk about it. And by the way, I want really this talk to be interactive. So if you have any question or feedback, just feel free to stop me at any moment. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I will just ignore you and move on. So I will just display like a set of guidelines that I think are important that I have observed during my modest, modest experience in um, a production field. But I wanted just to give like a definition of what is production, because I have to do it. Everyone does it. So for me, what's production is super simple. It's not like a big sentence or a big paragraph. It's really easy. If there is like more than one person, and this one person is you, that will use your app, it is production. If you are developing an app and someone else will eventually use your app, you are in a production mode. So you have to be aware of it. So my first guideline that I have just like observed is people tend to ignore HTML. I don't know why. Where we have like when we have we are asked to develop a new feature, something. Um, a new capability, we always tend to go full JavaScript, get like the best framework, the best package. So it is a bit sad because HTML is actually quite powerful. It's fast, it's optimized for your browser, and it's there since 20 years, or I don't know, more than 20 years, so it's, it's really, really good. Um, just to give you an example, oops. I think I removed a slide, but it's fine. Just to give you an example, a simple example would be a tooltip. You know this kind of when you hover over a button and then you see a text? So the first reflex that I have seen is that people will just Google in some like tooltip package for R, which is also OK, and then just use the package, and the package rely on a JavaScript dependency, a CSS dependency, and you want to keep your Shiny app very light. You don't want to add a JavaScript dependency each day. So your app will be slower, it will load slowly, and you want to avoid it. So in how to do it with, with HTML, just to show you, because I really want to, to show some code today. So this is what it will be if, like a classical way. So there is a package in R, really good package. I'm not criticizing the developer. It's really good. It's called TP. And the package allows you to have tooltips. So if I, if I run the app, you can see here, I don't know, I think it's a bit small, but you can see the, the text, the hovering, which is really good. However, there is like a JavaScript dependency, a CSS dependency. You have to install the package. Maybe there are bugs. I don't think so. The developer of this package is really talented. Um, but you know what I mean. So let's see how we can do it in HTML. So in HTML, it's super easy. You can just create a div, wrap your text input inside the div, and you have an attribute called title, and you're done. 
So you don't need any package, you don't need any dependency, it's fast. I can run the, uh, the app, and now I see the hover text. Of course, it's not as flexible as the TP package, because the TP package might give you other like position of your tooltip, etc. But you are doing the job with one line of HTML. And it's quite cool, you don't need anything else. So this is the example about uh, HTML. Um, the next example that I want to talk about, I'm just looking if I can find, oops, this is another slide. Um, give me just a second, I will look for the script, and then, yeah, exactly, here. So in, um, sometimes I'm like asked to create an app and display a plot in which the user can just show and hide the plot or hide show table, you know, toggle, this kind of toggle things. And some people would always go for shiny.js, right? A JavaScript function, or use shiny.js toggle function, or use some fancy render UR UI output, which I really hate. But actually, you can do it in HTML pretty simply, using, using the summary details uh, HTML tags. So here, for example, I used shiny.js, which also works perfectly fine, but you are using like, you are adding a JavaScript dependency, you're coding JavaScript in your Shiny app, and it works. Show hide, it works. Pretty fine. But I don't know, if it's possible to do that in HTML, let's do it in HTML, and in HTML it's really, really simple. So you have to just use the summary tag, put the text that you want to display, and wrap everything inside the details tag. Pure HTML, nothing fancy. And inside the details tag, you have your plot or your table or anything that you want to display hide. And then you can just run the app. And then it works. And you have like just saved some JavaScript code that could have developed into something like weird. Because to be honest, we are R developers. We're not JavaScript developers. So let's keep away the JavaScript word as much as possible, if possible. So this is about HTML. The second observation that I want to share, and I think that would help a lot um, your production base or your code base, is I want to talk about shiny modules. And I think many people misunderstand the goal of shiny modules. Because what we do, or what I've seen, is that we have a big shiny apps, and then we want to add an, a, a tab, so we create a shiny modules. But always I have seen that people use the NS, the namespacing, which can be useful, but it's super ugly. Because you should have an ID which is unique in your code base. And then in your dev tools, when you deploy your app, you can look for, like, for that ID and just find it quickly in your, in your, in your, in your code. But in the namespace, you're polluting your ID. For, therefore, Shiny NS or Shiny namespace is only needed if you are using or you are going to use this module or this app part several times inside your app. Otherwise, it is not needed and do not pollute your IDs with NS. So again, an example. I think I have an example here. So here, this is the classical way. Even RStudio, if you want to, uh, to do like, um, if you write, for example, here, shiny mod, it will give you the NS logic. And this NS logic, you don't need it only if, I mean, you only need it if you are using the module several times within your app, which is really rare, let's be honest. So you will have your model here, for example, empty cars UI, and then empty cars server, and then here I call my modules, just like a UI, and the server, super fancy, super simple, and then, get my, my plot. But the issue here is like, in my render plot or my plot output, I have like a PLT as an ID. But here I have something else. If I go to the dev tools, I will find another ID here. It's like the NS, which is some prefix, I wrote it now, and the ID that I need. And I hate that, because I want to have the same ID in the dev tools and in my, in my, in my code. So this is the thing that bothers me a lot about NS. And NS are actually only functions. 
when you think about it. It's not fancy or something. It's just R, pure R function that you can call in your, in your Shiny app. So uh, that would be better if we rewrite this code here in the following way. So it will be, where is the correction? NS. Sorry, NS good. Here. So it, we just like get rid of the NS stuff. We don't need it. We are going to use it only once in our app. Here I have my Shiny or my HTML element. And here I have my normal server functions. And then I run it. I call my, my function here. And I call my server function here. Again, Shiny models are just functions. Nothing more, nothing less. And then I run my app. Oops, sorry, I forgot to get rid of the NS here. And here it's perfect. When there is an issue, I can like, look at my ID, and it's actually PLT. And then I can copy this here. I have, let's imagine I have a Shiny app of 2,000 line of code or something. I can control Shift F, look for the ID, find the function, debug. Easy. That was about the, uh, the NS. Now let's talk about another topic, which is a little bit controversial, but I will stick to it. And I think we shouldn't modularize our app into Shiny modules or into functions. Shiny modules are good. When we have a big apps, we can just like, you know, create separate R files, and each R file has a module or a set of function. However, since like two, three years, I tried to do it in R6, and it's amazing. It is the best way to organize your application. And maybe some people will say I hate R6, and it's fine. But I hate it too. At the beginning, I was like, I would never use R6. What is R6? But now, just trust me, you will thank me later. It is a game changer for your app. So just as an example, I've created here uh, like an application. Usually it's like, let's say it's like some function here, uh, get mpg data, you will get the ggplot mpg, then there is a ui function, mpg plot ui, which is like a ui set of functions, and then you have your server function. And then you have your shiny app, and you call your functions through modules. It's super easy. And then you run the app, it works, I don't need to run it. It's a simple app. But, and of course, this is only a small example, right? It's a small example, it's a small app. Just imagine now you're working with a huge app with like many processes, many files, many functions, etc. Rewrite this code here into R6 is just like, will give you another level of proficiency. So how I will do it, personally, if I have like a new tab that I will attach in my app, I will just create an R6 class. I will have a public uh, element inside and a private element inside. So in each R6, you have a public list and a private list. A public list will be just a function that will be accessed later. And private method, you can think about, it, uh, about them as helper functions that the user really won't need, but you need them to build your public method. So I will, only have, I will also have like a, a public uh, list with some exposed functions. So I'll have a UI function. I will have a server function. And then in my private, I will have my helper function. It can be anything. So I can be, I have like the get mpg data, the render mpg plot. If I had to observe something, I will create a function that's called observe anything. It's really readable. And what's cool about R6 is that if I have like a reactive value or a data frame that's defined anywhere in the, in the R6 class, for example, in the server or in the private method, I can actually set this data or this reactive value to an internal element of my R6 class and use it everywhere without like passing it through parameters, through functions, and it's so much better. It's like another experience of coding. Um, and this is exactly what I will do. I will do this way and then have my R6 class, and then I will create a new instance of my class and call the UI, call the server. And I will run it. Works perfectly. OK. Now. So I, I don't like really, I don't like memes, but I think this meme is perfectly suited for this situation. So here is like, you know, global app, one function, one UI, one server. 
yeah, it's okay if you have a small app. And then he's like, modules as functions, it's better than a global app. But then module as an R6 class, it's perfection. So this is like the method that I want to display in terms of modularizing your Shiny application. The fourth uh, thing, or the first, the first subject that I wanted to talk about is, I know it's obvious, it's something that is obvious, but I have no idea why. I have seen so many apps that render the data in the client side. And by rendering the data in the, in the client side, I mean using the DT package, because most people use the DT package, right? The big DT package. And instead of displaying or rendering the data in the server, they use the, um, I'll show you here, the, an example so that you can understand. So in DT, or in data table, there is a parameter called server. And you can set it, by default, it's set to true. So you display the data, but your data is in the server side. But you can tweak it, you can change it, and you can say server equal false. The default is true, but many people do server equal false. They want to display the data in the client side. Can someone tell me why people do that? Yeah? You're, you're close. I mean, we are in the shiny world, so we don't really need crosstalk. Crosstalk is good if you want to avoid shiny and you, want to you don't want to deploy a server, but here we are. It's, I mean, but you're close. The, I, No, no, let's talk about the shiny world. Like, people are doing shiny, and they do server equal, um, equal true, uh, or equal false, I'm sorry. They want to render in the UI. There is one advantage only when you do server equal false. Um, and it is that you can attach a button to your table here, and then you can actually download the data immediately with this, like, extension. This is a DT extension. So if you want to download the data, we're using these DT extensions, you have to put like server equal false, or so give the data in my UI in the browser, and then the user can click in the CSV, download all the data. And don't do that. Just never do that. If you want to download the data, just create a download button. In Shiny, there is a download handler. Just create a download handler, observe it, download the data. It's easy, it's like five lines of code, don't do that. Because if you do that, you're exposing your data in the, in, the, in the client side. And then if you have like a moderately large data set, or like a few thousands of rows, then your, your app will be so slow. And you will actually get a warning from, from Shiny. So if I use another data set here, let's say from ggplot2, I think they have the diamond data set. Oops. Uh, it's hard to code it with one hand. Diamonds. And if I run this, look, I'm already, it's already slow. It's already slow. I'm having like an, an error for, or a warning from, RC, uh, from Shiny. It says, it seems your data is too big for client side, uh, blah, blah, blah. So never do that. Instead, what you want to do, oops, what you want to do is just use the download handler and just create here a download button in Shiny, and then observe it. And then just like output do uh, data download, which is the ID of the download handler. I mean, you don't have to observe it. You have just to render it. And then call the download handler, and you're done. And then you can click on download data, and then you can download your data. That's it. So conclusion, never render your data in the client side. Yes? Yeah, yeah? No, no, actually you can also do it in the server side. It's a good question, but you can do it in the server side. Because DT by default offers you some like inputs element. It's like input, 
uh, your ID of the ID of your DT and then selected rows underscore selected rows and you can use it both in the UI and the server it's really independent from from in the way you host your data but it's a good question okay let's move on with the fifth recommendation yeah this is really simple also but I, I don't know I have seen many apps that don't do this and I don't understand why it's so easy to implement it so if you have an app which is slow and you have like an interaction which takes a lot of time please make it explicit that something is happening. I hate when I click something, a button, something is loading, but I don't know, I'm not sure. So I will refresh, I will click again three times, and then the app will render five times and it will crash. It's horrible. So if you have to operate like a costly operation, make it explicit, you know? So what I have seen is this kind of, of doing. It's... I have like an H1 here, an action button, and I just created a function that, a lot of function, I just call sit sleep for five seconds. So look how frustrating it is. If I click here, I should wait. But I have no indication that I'm, that I'm waiting. So I don't know what's happening. And it stressed me. And this is like the fact, users, users of your app will wait. They will be patient, but they have to know that something is happening. Users, users can, can wait if they know something is happening. This is a golden rule. So show them that something is happening. What I would do is just a suggestion. There is a really good package called Shiny Buzzy, which is really simple. You just call here Shiny Buzzy, add Buzzy Spinner, and then you just run the app. It's one line of code. Click, to, click here, and then you will see the loading things on the top right. And this loading, it, it, it brings me peace. It brings me like, I don't know, some satisfaction that I can't wait, that something is happening, it's okay. So this is also very important. It's super simple, but it's important. Six, reactive values, right? I think it's the best variables in, in Shiny. I use reactive values everywhere. But in R Shiny, it's a bit weird. They are, there is like two types of reactive values. There is reactive values, and then there is reactive val. Fortunately, in Shiny for Python, they decided to remove reactive values. There's only reactive val. It is a really good idea, and they did really well. Uh, so why is it an issue? So reactive values are powerful, but, are, but they are really dangerous. So in Shiny, for me, the most important when you are doing Shiny development is how many time has that? You got no, no time left. <laughs> a time left? No, yeah, you're, you're out of time, I'm afraid. <laughs> ah, okay. So tell me when I have, should stop. I will stop. I will. I mean, we just need to wrap up now, basically. <laughs> okay, just interrupt me when I need to stop. Just I will. I will look at you now from now and then see your, your sign. So when using reactive uh, in Shiny, what's really important is like detecting the reactive variables in your code. When you can detect reactive variables, it's it's super easy to work with Shiny, and then you know where is the reactivity. So in using reactive values. I think you should, or we should, always, so I will just give you a bad example, what I think a bad example is. Um, so I will just go here in RV, and a bad example would be to use reactive values. So why is it a bad example? Because reactive values are just like normal variables. So I can just use here reactive values, give it a name of my reactive values, a default value, and then when I call them, look what it looks like. It looks like a normal R code, I have no clue if, it is, if this is like a reactive value or not. If my code base is like 20,000 line of code, yeah, I cannot know. So last, last thing, so what you should do, or what we should do is always, always, and I would just like do the last thing here, use reactive val here, and always add uh, a suffix on your variable names when using reactive value, underscore rv, and why, why reactive val is really good is when you call them, you add a parenthesis. For example, here I'm calling my empty case RV. With the parenthesis, it's also, it's helping me. And then with the RV, I'm sure that the reactive value and the reactive value. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.